over 92% of our offices are uh, in the size of one to five employees. I remember I have been uh, in talks where in Italy uh, they were super astonished and said, oh, that's in Europe. Yes, it's in Europe. So it's not like only in Italy in that size or in Germany. Um, in these times of fast change, have you ever thought architecture might be falling a bit short and wondered what's next? Well, let's find out. My name is Luca De Stefano, I'm one of the founders of Nona, and this is Boundary Breaking Businesses Beyond Architecture. Designers and commissioners of tomorrow speaking today. Episode 1, Part 1. Architecture as an industry and everything you need to know about it. Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of Beyond Architecture. We're really excited to have you here. This is for us a big new adventure and we want to start it with an episode that it's all about understanding the architecture industry from a business perspective. The idea is that if we want to go beyond, we first have to understand where are we standing today. So we will try to look at architecture from a business perspective and we will do it through the expertise, data and insights of the Architects Council of Europe and their 2022 sector study. The Architects Council of Europe is the one organization representing professionally architects with European institutions for over 30 years. Today's guest is the president of the council. We will split this episode in two parts. The first part is all about understanding the numbers and facts that regulate the market of architecture in Europe. The second part will be instead a bigger elaboration on what are the trends the past, the present, and the future of the architectural profession. So, even if you are not interested in the European market, stay with us. At the end of the first part, I will share with you some general facts on worldwide data, numbers, and trends. And at the end of the second part, we will do a quick elaboration on what we learned throughout the episode. And creatively, I will try to come up with a suggestion on a potential business model that could be boundary breaking, as our title says for you to implement into your everyday practice. So that's it, let's get started. We connect with Brussels, Belgium, because today at Beyond Architecture, we talk with Ruth Schagemann. Well, hello, Ruth Schagemann, how are you? (laughs) Hello, Luca, Um, nice to hear you and thank you for your invitation. And yes, I'm fine, looking forward to our talk. Yeah, thank you so much for joining, Ruth. And uh, I, I want to jump right into the topic. Why do we need a sector study? Like, why do you guys invest so much time and effort into putting together all this data? Uh, look, uh, for, for us as architects and as the Architects Council of Europe, uh, you know, we represent over 600,000 architects, uh, in Europe, meaning, um, they are doing uh, with their offices a lot of work, uh, in Europe. And, uh, it is really important to have an overview, not only about which topics they are dealing with, but how many are we? Um, what ties do the offices have? How big is the market? How big is the architectural market compared to the construction market? And um, the one thing is to know more about each other. But the other thing is then also to use it for advocacy, no? because the Architects Council of Europe well, represents the architects, but one um, important issue that we are doing on European level is advocate legislative processes. And therefore, we really need statistics and numbers. And yes, and the sector study is also supported and funded by Creative Europe. And there, it really shows how important it is also for the European uh, entities like the European Parliament or the European Commission to have more knowledge about the profession itself. Mm. I understand. You mentioned advocacy, which I think is, is one of your core activities. I also find it quite useful as an architect myself to to know where the profession stands. And you can imagine in Europe, you know, we are really diverse. The diversity is the richness uh, in Europe and um, the same diversity we also have in the profession itself. So, yes, we have to learn 
what <laughs> our colleagues are doing. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. And you, you mentioned before more than 600,000 architects represented by the council today. Is that a number that encompasses all architects in Europe at the moment? Uh, yes, exactly. And it's a number out of our sector study. You know? So uh, we are aware through our member organizations uh, how many architects are working. Well, it's not. Well, yes, we know how many architects are working in Europe actively. Mm. Uh, I'm uh, talking about numbers. I had quite some fun on your online observatory. Maybe this is useful also for listeners to check out. If you go to aceobservatory.com, you would actually get all these numbers, right, Ruth? Uh, like quite a big overview of all the sector study results. Yes. Uh, thank you for mentioning the observatory. That's really an important tool. And I'm happy that you are having fun uh, and enjoying to look at it. And yes, I can really recommend it to everyone who is interested to have a little peek into it and see what's what's going on um, in yeah, in the field of the architect's profession. So yes, it's great. It's important. And it's a fun. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it gives, I don't know, at least for me, this big sense of understanding. Oh, okay, here are things. Here is how it works. Like we are so put into our little practice and doing our everyday life that sometimes we forget there is a bigger picture. Like architecture is indeed an industry, right? So it can be monitored. It can be understood as a as a mass uh, entity rather than single individuals only. Yes, uh, Luca, you're absolutely right. And uh, what you're mentioning is also important to understand because sometimes we always think uh, it's only like that uh, in my area, let's say so. And suddenly you realize, oh, but, you know, the others have either the same problem or um, are organized in a similar way. Just to give you an example, uh, over 92% of our offices are uh, in the size of one to five employees. Um, I remember I have been uh, in talks where then, for example, uh, in Italy, uh, they were super astonished and said, oh, that's in Europe. Yes, it's in Europe. So it's not like only in Italy in that size or in Germany. Um, yes, we have obviously also bigger uh, architectural offices in the Scandinavian countries, but let's say the mm -hmm. average is a small entity and it's not only like this in one country it's really around europe like that so yes we yeah. learn more about each other okay interesting so 92 percent of practices are either single owner or maximum five employees yes and do you think like uh, i have a big curiosity on this do you think this is because in the end, many architects freelance for other architects and therefore the result as one company, even though they are employed by others, or is it because actually they already serve clients in this format of being one maximum five? Um, yes, we analyzed um, this topic in the past uh, a bit in depth and uh, we come to the conclusion that it's the demand of the client that we are structured in this way. No, and, um, mm. let's say it's also about the size of projects, no, uh, on which the architects are working. And, um, yes, I think it really reflects the connectivity between the client and the offices. Um, okay. Um, I want to try something very hard today. I want to talk about numbers in a podcast, which is almost like, impossible mission but let's see let's see what we can manage if we can keep it interesting um i was wondering if you have maybe a couple of numbers that came out of this report that made you think wow this is interesting this could be useful to know yes um for example what what is uh, really interesting is that the architecture so the construction market has been growing uh, the same as um, the architectural uh, market so we are discussing about a market that is getting bigger so mm -hmm. means also in that respect that there is really a lot of work to be handled um by the architectural uh, offices or the architect's offices. And, um, this is one point. And maybe also, uh, we have to imagine that these numbers, um, half of the output comes from 
let's say four countries, which are Germany, France, UK is still included in the sector study and Italy. So these are the big contributors. And, um, I think that is a very surprising number. And the total market size has, uh, raised. So it's one quarter bigger than in 2020. Okay. Wait a second. I need to process this. Yes. <laughs> so you said that basically like four countries contribute to most architects in Europe. And they were Italy, Germany, France, uh, France and UK and UK. Okay. And this is quite, I mean, I knew about Italy. I'm myself Italian. There is a lot of talking about the fact that we have way too many architects in Italy and that they end up like myself working abroad. Yes. Um, and do you maybe have some indication on that? Like how many of the actual professionals get licensed in a country and move to another? Um, yes, we have, um, only, I think it's 8%, uh, work in another country in Europe. And, um, so that's not like a huge number, but you have to imagine, and this is the fantastic situation that we have in Europe, that we have a service market together. And, um, therefore the free mobility in uh, Europe is really important. And it can be in the field of owning. So if you are a practitioner in your own office and you deliver services into another country, but it can also be in the element of being employed, no? so that you look for a job in a different um, country. And therefore, um, it's really important that we recognize our education and that we also have a high level of education throughout all uh, member states um, in in Europe. Yeah. So it, it's two levels of mobility, right? It's either by I move to Germany, study there and then get into the job market. And in that case, do I count in your numbers as um, expat architect or do I count as a local architect in Germany? That's a good question, Luca, because okay. it's really, um, <laughs> you have, no, that's really, you're making a point because if you would, you, if you would like to use your title in Germany and, um, therefore you have to be recognized in Germany, then you count as a German architect. So, mm. uh, Luca de Stefano, uh, working in Germany, <laughs> um, part of, for example, the Chamber of Baden-Württemberg, you would be a German architect. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's useful. So in this 8% you mentioned before, actually, we don't count all those that live and are registered locally where they work. Exactly. No, that okay. is really, uh, then you, because you have the full rights. Basically, I, I think that's a nice, uh, concept, no, because you have the full rights as a German architect and then there is no difference. And, and then you mentioned as well before the fact that the, there is this kind of proportional growth between construction markets and architectural service markets. Uh, so if, if we build more architects earn more, basically, if I make it very, very simple. Yes. Um, out of this architectural service market, what are the top projects? Like what are the sectors where architects have the most job opportunities? Well, um, the situation at the moment is that really a lot of architects are um, working on single housing, which is really, let's say, um, in your one question, you are uh, tackling two problems um, in the sense that uh, if we look at climate change, um, climate uh, resilience for the future and climate mitigation, then uh we really have to rethink uh, the construction field, uh, the construction sector, because how are we going to build more new um, houses or buildings in the future? Or in my opinion, and let's say what is really discussed also in Europe on European level, is that we have to deal with the existing building stock. No, So um, I think this is a really big paradigm change. And um, also uh, the second point um, that you mentioned is, is single family housing really the sector uh, of delivering services of the future? 
No, because if we discuss about uh, not using up so much land um, and trying to be more dense in our cities um, to revitalize, uh, for ex example, industrial um, areas, industrial areas, that means uh, that we might be heading in the future into a different direction and we have to prepare for that. Okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So housing staying the big driving force for for construction industry but at the same time how do we make the shift how do we work on the important projects the ones that can make an impact and reduce those that make the negative impact i guess yes exactly and mm. and also uh, think about we have a big housing crisis in uh, europe so uh, it's a real major topic and uh, the big question is and every government Uh, France is dealing with it. Germany is dealing with it. I'm sure that in Italy, it's also an issue how to provide um, affordable housing in a quality that uh, reflects the dignity of the human being. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I project this on my experience here in the Netherlands. Like the Netherlands is leaving depopulation on certain areas. And the major cities are growing and booming and the housing stock is not sufficient and very unaffordable. Uh, and I, I imagine this is more or less what all the world is going through, like with, with global urbanization being the major trend. How do you provide housing in the right places and how do you avoid building crazy amounts of new, very impactful buildings everywhere around cities? Um, I don't know. You, you, it feels like the ACE has been quite busy also with this type of topics, like not only with the sector study, but you have also uh, been supporting policy advice and research. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. No, research is, uh, important, um, for us to uh, bring the profession forward with new approaches to uh, certain elements. Therefore, um, we have, uh, three colleagues working here in the office only on European research projects. So, um, let's say this is one, uh, important part. And at the moment, a lot is really dealing with, um, capacity building. And, um, you know, on innovative subjects like materials or refurbishment and, and retrofit. And, um, the other element is, uh, to really be part of the legislative process and try to, uh, yes, advocate, uh, the needs, uh, in this changing period. For example, in the Energy Performance Building Directive, which has really made a big change uh, from the old one to the new one, because you have to imagine that in the old one, uh, it was only about energy efficiency and new buildings. And now in the new uh, revised version, which is in the trilogue, and the trilogue means that the European Parliament, the European Commission and the European Council are deciding on the document at the moment. They're in this decision-making process. And in this now, it is really um, taken into consideration the existing building stock. So totally different. And also we are trying to implement the CO2 footprint. Um, that is also a real big change to the former one. And the third point, it's uh, not exhausted in the document, but at least it is implemented that we also think about neighborhoods. So it's not about only one building. It's also taking into consideration a whole uh, neighborhood. I, I hear three, three points agenda. Uh... You mentioned CO2 footprint, you mentioned existing building stock and neighborhoods and communities. So this is what you have been working on in terms of policy advice, I guess, and also yes. in terms of capacity building. Do I hear you right? Yes, absolutely, Luca. And we are working on um, this since already two years. And you can imagine that, um, let's say, in the European context, it's really about trust building, trust building towards European parliamentarians, trust building towards um, the European Commission, and then also trust building through our member organizations towards their governments, because these are in the 
European Council. At the first sight, you think, oh, that's huge, no? But we have to say, and the experience shows us, it's about people. So there is only one person um, in charge in the European Parliament who is a rapporteur on this document. So uh, we can direct, let's say, our efforts to certain people and that is really a benefit in the European community that um, it sounds large, it sounds abstract, what is uh, the EU, who is it and let's say out of the work that we are doing it's about people who are engaged in all these different uh, levels and it's not like 100 people, it's might be, I can tell you, five on one topic. Okay. That's very interesting. Like, you know, from the outside, it feels like this is a big machine, but then it's nice to get an inside look through, through your experience. And yes. I wonder, uh, Ruth, like, if I understand right, the ACE, so the Architects Council of Europe, it's basically a representation of all the local architects council around each different country. Is that the case? Uh, yes. So you have to imagine that um, in the Architects Council of Europe, our member organizations are our members, no? And these member organizations then represent the national architects um, at the ground. Okay. This is interesting because I assume then that most of this data you gathered in the sector study comes out of these partner organizations. Is that the case? Yes, exactly. And um, uh, we rely, and therefore, let's say, ACE as such um, is really the strong work together with our member organizations. Now, our member organizations um, send delegates into different work groups, for example, no, to um, develop uh, the policy that we uh, then represent and reflect uh, towards uh, the European entities. And um, another point is like the gathering, what you mentioned, uh, for example, data on the sector study. And funnily, uh, next week um, they will meet um, to improve uh, the sector study because, for example, some of our member organizations have aligned their national um, uh, questionnaires with the sector study. So uh, the architect doesn't have to um, fill out so many questionnaires. He only gets one questionnaire with the national issues and also the European um, uh, questions. And it would be, let's say, if I have a dream, I would dream that more of our member organizations are aligned with our sector study because these data are really valuable and um, they are the only ones who can provide um, this information. I see. So would that mean that when you mention 620,000 architects more or less being represented by by the ACE and being active in Europe, you're actually counting only licensed architects through the organizations that partnered up with the ACE? Yes, yes, they have to be. And then obviously we have countries like Scandinavian countries where you don't have uh, this licensing in that sense as it's known in uh, France, Italy, uh, Germany, UK. And then um, we rely on the numbers that the member organizations have um, throughout their memberships. Yeah. Okay. And do you have any, I mean, this is maybe a hard question, but do you have any idea of how many people actually graduate from architecture? And if there is a big discrepancy between <laughs> the ones that get licensed and get through your numbers and the ones that actually get a degree and end up doing something around architecture? Luca, you are really challenging me. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. This would be a number uh, that we would like to have. Um, but we can't um, provide it because our member organizations are not schools. They are um, chambers, associations or unions. And uh, we are now in talks with the EAAE. That's the representation of the uh, European schools. And the president is quite active working on trying to develop um, such a kind of study uh, for the schools. So this would be one question in their field of responsibility and yes we would like to know more about it but for the time being we don't have this number
Okay, we are at the end of the first part. We went through lots of interesting numbers. I think by now you understood quite well how the European market is working today. Let me share a few numbers that I think could be interesting worldwide. First, there is around 116,000 architects licensed in the US in 2022. So we could say it's almost one sixth of the architects that are currently licensed and operating in Europe. Keep in mind that as we discuss with, uh, with Ruth, there is many more that are operating today within the realm of architecture. I make the example of the Netherlands, where lots of people with architectural degrees don't actually get licensed, but work and design architectural projects every day. Same might happen in US or in other countries. Second interesting number. So according to the International Union of Architects, a few years back, there were around 1.3 million licensed architects in the world. This data came from around 124 countries and related organizations that are connected to the union. So we could imagine there is countries that are not represented and once again, a lot of people not being licensed, but operating in the industry. So as a rough estimate, if we want to guess, okay, how many architects are out there today? Well, there isn't any official source. We spent quite some time looking into it, but what we could tell is that roughly we could be in the range of 1.7 million to 3.5 million. It's a big range, it's a big number. The very notion of architect might vary and change from country to country. Therefore, it's quite hard to narrow it down to a specific number, but you could, you could keep this delta, this big range as your go-to parameter. If we pick something in the middle, we could say 2.5 million, that's the number to go for. One last note, as you heard from Ruth, the construction market grows and the architectural service market grows proportionally to it. This means that, in theory, we could apply the same ratio and the same logic for the global economy. Therefore, the global construction market could be a nice and interesting indicator for us to examine how big is the architectural service market. There is lots of market studies out there. Many of them are for sale and they're quite expensive. We investigated it's around $1,000 to get one. But if you're very interested, go ahead, purchase one, and please let us know if you find anything interesting. We go back to the episode for the second part. Stay with us. Skip ahead. Let's go.